I've never had a job. I mean, I was a drug dealer and a, and a stick up kid until I got sober. Three, four years in, I, I cleared my first million dollars. All in all, he gave me $24 million. That is nothing compared to the education that I got in the several years that we were partners. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Dawson. Welcome back to another episode of Building Billions. I have a special guest today and look, uh, as you know, my new book, The Nine Figure Mindset, how to go from zero to over a hundred million dollars is coming out here in about six weeks. You can pre-order it right now. But one of the things I love about this community and hanging out with people who have proven to succeed, like my buddy Eric here, he is not only a nine figure mindset entrepreneur, he is a nine figure exit entrepreneur. That's right. <laughs> And it's one thing to talk about nine figures. Oh, I'm worth a hundred million. I'm this, this. This is another thing to actually exit and put it the cash in the bank. That's an entirely different game. And uh, and this guy's played both sides of the game. So I'm excited to introduce you to Eric. I'm going to have him introduce himself, where he's come from, what he's done, and we're going to get into it. Eric, Brandon, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure. Um, you know, for the folks that I don't know uh, or don't know me, I should say I grew up about 45 minutes north of Boston. I got enrolled in America's addiction crisis at a very young age. For me, that was Oxycontin at the age of 14, uh, which turned into a heroin addiction, which for about six, almost seven years, uh, I went through hell. And I hit rock bottom on December 7th of 2006. I've consistently been sober and in recovery since that date. So this December will be 17 years uh, of recovery and sobriety. And it was out of my pain of addiction and my enthusiasm and excitement for recovery that I started my business, which I started in October of 2008 as the first sober living home in the state of New Hampshire. And when I sold it 13 years and two months later, uh, in December of 2021, it was the largest provider of addiction treatment services in the Northeast. Wow. I mean, yeah. so, you know, people talk about one of my uh, mentors told me in my 20s, he said, hey, when you when you find something and, and what caused the conversation was the flip phone. I was like, man, I love this phone. And he's like, you should go buy the stock. And I'm like, why? And he goes, because anytime you have a personal experience where you use something and you're like, this is unbelievable. That's an indicator that if you feel that way, a lot of people are going to feel yep. that way and you should go buy the stock and invest in it because it's probably going to do well. In your case, the experience that you went through, the negative experience in the, of, of drug use propelled you to want to solve that problem for other people once you got sober. That's right. And you went on a journey and you found your way to sobriety. That's right. So you're like, I can help others do it which is what I always tell people is the people you should be learning from are the ones that actually have done it. Lived experience and have the resume. I talk about that all the time. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that's exactly how it went. And, and in the beginning, I had no idea really what I was doing. I dropped out of the high school at 15 years old in the beginning of 10th grade. My father owned a small business, so I learned about like small business and business principles from him. Um, but I just knew that I was watching a lot of people suffer. I grew up you know, in an area, New Hampshire actually ended up being the worst in opioid addiction and the leader in the country for opioid overdose death. And so, I mean, Donald Trump, when he was running for office, called New Hampshire a drug infested den, uh, which you think of New Hampshire, you think of mountains and lakes and it's this beautiful place to live. I think of a little tiny state like I yeah, most people don't even know where it is. They're like, is that a part of New York? And I'm like, no, it's above <laughs> Boston. But um, it's it really was ground zero for the opioid epidemic for for pharmaceutical pills and heroin and so I was just watching kids that I grew up with that I loved like family and they were still in the struggle and then you know it was just affecting my community and in my entire world and I wanted to do something the origination of the of the business was actually volunteer work I was going I was so passionate about it that I was going into these facilities that were kind of run down and run by the state and I was just going and connecting with people that wanted help getting sober and that were trying. And then in that, uh, you know, was the idea, I was like, these people need a place to go. I could turn this into a small business. I've always wanted to be in real estate. I want to help people. And I pulled it all together. And so at 23 years old, 
with a little bit of help from my dad, uh, who believed in me again after a long period of not believing in me, I bought a three-family home in October of 2008, which was an interesting time to be buying real estate yeah, yeah. because the world was melting. Yep. And, uh, and so we bought it, it for $150,000. It was bank foreclosed. I got some furniture donated. I moved into it, and then I just started charging guys like 150 bucks a week to come stay with me. And then when they, I lived there for two years with the guys. Was, and you'd you'd help them through their transition. I did everything with them. Yeah. I taught them recovery. I taught them life skills. I taught them, you know, how to change their life. Yeah. And that's that was the foundation of it. But I never imagined that that would at the time would grow into this enormous company. And it was big at the end. And so, so when you sold it, how big was it? 325 employees we have did about 55 million of top line revenue and i transacted off a 13 million dollar ttm ebitda so so you go from your own personal recovery to helping a f couple people at a time doing it to yep. creating a business where you had over 300 and would you say 50 employees 325 325 employees. Employees. and we had 440 treatment beds which turned over frequently and so we did you know between four and five hundred missions a month and so you know we were doing i don't know five six thousand lives touched a year wow yeah talk about impact tons tons not an easy job not easy businesses but worth it yeah especially my it. guess is is that you see a lot of people come through that really are striving to make that that change that you made and some of them can't make the long-term journey and then you have to see some of that huh? you have to see all of it yeah you have to see all of it and so you know you balance the extreme lows of death of overdose of suffering of abandoned children of grieving parents with the high of the ones that make it and yep. the ones that do it. And so when you see them get their year sobriety, their two year sobriety coins, you know, you see them reunify with their children, you see them get back into the workforce, be good parents, you know, you, you watch their families who you met at a time of distress when they came into treatment are able to like relax and put their shoulders down a little bit over time. And you see those relationships repaired. And so it's, there's no, it's very, it's black or white. It, these situations typically end up terrible or amazing. Mm. Very few in the middle. And so you have to focus on the positive and, and work your way through a lot of the negative stuff and, and kind of develop a tolerance to it. Yeah. I can't imagine. I mean, it just sounds tough. It was tough. Yeah. Which was, at the time, there were a lot of reasons why I sold my business. And 13 years on the front lines. When fentanyl showed up in America, which was probably 2013 or so, a lot of people don't understand this, that the, the addiction crisis started with Oxycontin in the mid to late 90s. On the backs of that, the cartels took advantage of pharmaceutical companies creating opioid addicts, and they started flooding our streets <clears throat> with heroin, real heroin. And, and then as things progressed, they, they changed the game. And in 2013, around 12, 14, fentanyl showed up and replaced heroin as a drug in America entirely. There's not a bag of real heroin on the streets of America in any section. It is all explicitly fentanyl now. And so everyone today understands this enormous overdose death crisis. It hasn't always been like that. That happened after the introduction of fentanyl. And, um, and now, today, and for some years already, overdose death by opioids, specifically fentanyl, is the leading cause of accidental loss of life. It was probably five or six years ago it surpassed car accidents in America. Statistically, you're more likely to die of a fentanyl overdose than a car accident. And so when I was so close to the sun on that, there was weeks where I, I couldn't make plans Monday through Friday because I was at funeral services every wow. night like every single night and how do you pick and choose which ones you go to and which ones you don't there were nights that i was leaving one to go to another to go to another and people were just dying at scale and so it was that over time that it, it wore me down i got tired and it yeah. certainly was part of the i think that that a lot of people start businesses and own businesses like they're going to own them forever but businesses like everything else are cyclical and have a life cycle to them and 
And that was a piece of influence for me on what made the decision to sell. So I've, I've never uh, used drugs in my life. Like I, I, I can't relate, I think, yeah. to, uh, and, and the thing that I'm probably most appreciative is that my grandpa, who was like my, <laughs> the guy I was most afraid of growing up as a kid, he was like, he was like the man of the family. He was a captain in the Oregon State Police. And so I always wanted to follow his foot tracks. And, and, and I thought I was going to be a cop. Uh, I, I was number three on the list as a cadet my senior year in high school to go into the OSP program. And they only hired two that year. And thank God. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I ended up having to go get a sales job, yep. right? Best thing um, that ever, best happened, thing to ever yeah. happened to me. So, so, so look, um, I don't even understand, like I get, I get that there there's differences, but I don't really structurally understand fentanyl versus heroin versus it's 50 to 100 times more potent uh, than fentanyl is 50 to 100 times more potent than heroin is and it's inconsistent heroin was a consistent product meaning that i would do this bag of heroin that bag of heroin that it all all have the same effect P fentanyl this they all look the same this one might have the potency of this that one has the potency of that and then that bag has this potency and that's the one that's going to kill you and so it's every time, every single time you use fentanyl, it is Russian roulette. And, and is it, is it like heroin comes from poppy flowers, plants, right? Yeah, poppy well, plants. What does fentanyl come from? It's made in a lab. It's so synthetic. It's, it's a chemical. It's a chemical. It's synthetic. Yeah, it's a synthetic. And that's why product. it's flooded because it's easier for them to make it and, and there's no quality control. Program. Correct. So it's whoever happens to make it and however they make it. Yeah. But, I mean, the messaging from from the government, I guess, is that it's coming from China and distributed by the cartels. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, it's, uh, yeah, I can see why you'd be like, oh, now we got, we're, the streets have been flooded. It's one thing for somebody to have an addiction and have an impact their life. It's another thing for someone to, to like you said, play Russian roulette every time they're, mm -hmm. they use, right? Yep. Yeah, so look, it's a crisis. There's no question. In fact, one of the reasons that Grant and I, um, partnered and acquired and started uh, with Breca 10X Health was to get everybody off of drugs. Like, yeah. like, like we are huge believers that all this stuff that's being prescribed in the medical space is just contributing to that problem. The one, um, kudos on the 10X healthcare program. I've been with Gary for quite some time now and you guys have changed my life. Awesome. I have the whole setup of my house. I got the oxygen, I got the red light, I got the whole nine. Um, and so for everyone, real deal, they didn't pay me to say this, it's been absolutely life-changing. Um, but the entire medical system is jacked. And so it's, it's really corrupt and it's really messed up in America. You know, you look at, at the healthcare system, the insurance companies, and big pharma, and then the government, and you have these four monsters that are, that are in cahoots and, and playing in the sandbox together and then we trust our lives to them. You know, it's, it's uh, I've been in healthcare my entire adult life and got some stories to tell. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, honestly, I, I, I just, I look at, uh, I'm a little mind boggled, you know, it's like uh, being in healthcare, they'll tell you as an adult that you can't make the choice to buy something like testosterone or something without your doctor intervention and without all these approvals and you can't ship them across state lines and they'll go but they'll let a 14 year old start taking stuff that will change their hormone disposition not only that but not only that but you have children much younger than 14 years old being prescribed stimulant medication because they can't sit still and, and they're you know attention deficit attention yeah. you know ADHD and this stuff and, and the parents, most of them that are that are trusting the healthcare system and putting kids on these medications don't realize that Ritalin and Adderall are pharmaceutical grade crystal meth. I mean it's it's methamphetamine. It's I don't know how else to say that. It's crystal meth. I mean if you drug tested one of these children that's on medication, they would drug they would test positive for the same thing that if as if they had been abusing crystal meth. And so, I mean, it's just the, the, the pharma-driven healthcare system, um, 
Americans need a real education on what it actually is and isn't. Yeah, and, and I think it's not always in your best interest. No, and I think especially, uh, I think a lot of people's suspicions perked up with this whole vaccination thing. It's starting to come mm-hmm. to reality that it's killing more people than COVID did. Yeah, I mean yeah. it's just crazy. It's it sure just crazy. Is. And this isn't a political thing. It's just that you know, I, I just, I, I, I don't trust. Well, it's it's not a political thing, but one of the giant problems that we have here is that our healthcare system and, and healthcare conversations have become politicized. Yeah. Since when did politics get into my health care? You know, and, and to tell you that if you don't itself. do what they tell you to do, you can't travel, you can't go to work, you can't go to school, you can't yep. be involved in the community. I mean, this country went a long way away from where I thought it'd ever go in two years yep. when COVID hit. Like literally tell, like resting people were walking on the beach in California, but allowing riots to go on in Portland. Like I lived in Portland. I'm like, how is it that you could go out and have no issue rioting, but if you go to church, <laughs> the COVID they're going to throw you in there. jail. Only in the restaurants and the churches. Yeah. The, the riots were protected from the COVID. So it's, ridiculous, It's only dude. science, Brandon. <laughs> well, exactly, dude. Exactly. Well, we both have the same view on yeah, all that do. BS. Um, so, look, let's get back to business for a business, second. Yeah. So, so, first of all, you know, congratulations um, on – recovering congratulations on being committed to helping others do it and congratulations on it's hard enough to build a business let alone all that influence dramatics yep. passion pain it's really hard to build a business any business where that's involved as a normal data point every day yep it's one thing to have it on occasion but to be living in it every day so you build these businesses up. So talk a little bit about from from your three bedrooms, right, to 325 employees. Like, what are some of the things on that journey as a business owner? Because I talk a lot about break points. You yeah. know, 3 million, 8 million, 15 million. Like, what were your personal kind of professional and financial break points while you scaled and grew your business to 55 million? God, we could spend all day talking about this. Um, you know, it, it's, I remember employee number one, like the, the decision to hire the first guy to help me out doing some of this stuff. And for me, I had, I've never had a job. I mean, I was a drug dealer and a, and a stick up kid until I got sober and then, and worked in construction a little bit and then started this business. And so I was, I was learning how to fly the plane in, you know, at 40,000 feet for all of it. And so, you know, I, I, I started sales and, and seeing needs and services and things that, that this population needed. And so I started to meet those needs, which grew my business. And then I started to build and hire team members. And before I knew it, I just kind of figured it out. And in 2011, I think, yeah, 2011, I was three, four years in, I, I cleared my first million dollars. Wow. And so net profit. I made my first million yep. bucks, you know, not bad from 21 years old, homeless heroin addict, getting sober with two pairs of clothes, sleeping on a couch to 26 years old. I made my first million. And, you know, as I grew, there were a lot of things that I had to figure out. I had to figure out how to create systems. You know, when I had one facility, it was a totally different animal. And I, there were so many unexpected things from when I opened two. I I tell, like, I have the rule of three, right? So my rule of three is you never go from one to two. You go from one to three and then three to nine and then nine to 27. And that's true for hiring people and it's true for opening new facilities. I love that. I've actually never heard that before and I love that. That's just from the, all the recent, my own, you know, buying 130 businesses and then franchising and and licensing and then, and then all the research I did on the thousands of industries that we broke down from 2009 to 2019. Anytime I saw the average business owner go from one to two, they go broke. Yep. Because it's easy in your mind to go, I can rationalize two until the second one's not working and it pulls you off the one. But if you have to go to three, then you pause and you're like, well, I don't have the resources to go to three. And I certainly don't have the team to go to three. And I, I, I don't have the systems to go to three. So I better build on that before I go to three. Yeah. And it causes you to think differently. Same with an employee. You can always hire one person. But now... If it doesn't go right, you're like, is it me? Is it them? You need context and contrast. You hire two and one's doing great and one sucks. You're like, it's not me. 
it's the employee I got to get rid of. Yep. But every time you just do a one off thing, you don't have any context or contrast and it's easy to rationalize it, but it's hard to execute it. Absolutely. So you went to two and you're getting banged around a bit. And you know, I think a key leading characteristic to entrepreneurs is optimism because I got banged around as being modest. I got my ass kicked every day growing that business. And I went from one to two and two to three and three to four. And all of a sudden, you know, five years, six years had passed, 2016, 17. And I have a real business. I have hundreds of employees. I have multiple, multiple sites and I'm doing big numbers in revenue and I'm making ton of money. And I don't know the first thing about a leadership team, about an org chart, about KPIs, about systems, uh, you know, all of that was a foreign language to me. No one had, I didn't have any mentors, I didn't have any teachers or anyone to learn from that had participated in business at that level. And mind you, I'm, I live in New Hampshire, I grew up in New Hampshire, I'm not, this is one of the biggest companies at this point in the state that's not a national chain. And so I just didn't have really people to learn from. And I had 20 something direct reports at that time. I had everybody. I had HR, finance, each facility's executive director, admissions, marketing. I, I just, ever, you know, I had everyone reporting to me. I had just all kind of mid-level managers and no, no, no C-level and, and no top tier uh, executives. And so one of the things that's interesting that I did, you talk about those little moments like being number three for the police uh, school or whatever that change your life forever. I always like did my best to put myself in the room and put myself around the best people. And I would describe myself and I would describe most successful entrepreneurs as a sponge, right? I like to ask more questions and listen more than I like to talk because I, I'm able to get a lot of value that way. And so one of the things that I did was I bought an incredibly expensive to me at the time home in New Hampshire and got into this neighborhood. And here there's this little tattooed former criminal guy that owns drug rehabs moving into the most prestigious neighborhood in yep. the state. 2017, I'm walking my dog and um, through the neighborhood and I see one of the neighbors, a guy named, a wonderful man, one of the greatest mentors and teachers I've ever had. Um, and his name's Joe. And I see Joe and he's all happy. And Joe talking to him, he says, yeah, man, I just closed my deal. I said, what do, you, what do you mean you closed your deal? So I just sold my business for, and it's his business, but it was a much, I had a nine figure I get, exit, so did he. His was much larger than mine. Mm -hmm. He did very well. And he told me about it and I was like, Re and it just sparked it. I'd never met anyone that had sold the company before. I'd never considered selling my company before. I'd never, I knew nothing about it. And it just gave me this, this crack, the door cracked open this little peak hole into like, oh, there's a lot more for me to learn here. This guy just sold his business for hundreds of millions of dollars. And so I just asked him, I said, Joe, you know, would you be willing to have lunch with me? I just want to ask you some questions and, and learn more about this. We got lunch the next week and um, and that really opened the door into my self-education process of learning business at the level in which it takes to participate in private equity, M&A and all of that. And eventually it was his family office that invested the first three rounds. Hmm. And so it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, he bought, I sold him, uh, I sold him 10% for at a $40 million valuation for 4 million bucks. I sold them shortly thereafter, another 10 for five. And then I sold them, uh, and then the business valuation went up to 80 million and I sold them, uh, I, I forget the percentage, I think 18.75% or something like that. It's like, um, I, I took another 15 million off the table. So uh, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. You know, you, uh, most business owners don't understand what happens when you take a slug of money off the table. Yeah. You could sleep at night, you mean? <laughs> and and your confidence level. And all of a sudden, yeah, it seems easier you, to build faster because you're not it freaked out. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. It, it, it gives you confidence and it gives you speed because when I was built, I never took a, a dollar of investment money or a dollar of debt. I started the business at the beginning of the recession of 2008. Banking was shut down. And so I just got used to making money, earning money and putting it back into the business. And so you talked about like having nine figure value. There's a lot difference between having a business that's worth nine figures and having that liquidity. 
And, and so everything I had was in the business and all the money that I was making, I was living a very modest lifestyle for the numbers that I was touching and all the money that the business was making, I was putting right back in. So every single problem that the business had, every HR issue, every time we got sued by an employee, every regulatory issue felt like I was dodging headshots in the matrix yep. because I'm like, fuck, if this one sticks, I'm dead. And when I was able to take that money off the table, I was like, okay, I can, I could take a hit in the business and not have to like move out of my house. Like I can, I have a contingency plan with this money that's off the table. And so that certainly helped. The other thing that I don't think a lot of business owners understand is the value add of bringing sophisticated people to the table. Mm -hmm. The value, he, all <laughs> in all, he gave me, I think, uh, $24 million. He gave me 24 million bucks um, to uh, in those three parts put together. That is nothing compared to the education that I got in the several years that we were partners and the experience that I had with that. That that was invaluable. It really was. This And this is the basis and the genesis for why we started uh, our business, you know, uh, to be that resource for people before they have to take on the dilution. Yeah. And uh, my frustration is we help people and then help them achieve some huge results and they don't actually recognize or acknowledge <laughs> that. So I'll tell you, let me speak on that for a second. Yeah. He gave me twenty three million dollars. He was in the business for a little less than two years. We spent together and we sold it for one hundred and fifteen million. He walked with an additional twenty three million. He put twenty three million in. He walked with fifty six, doubled his money in less than two years. People look at that and I tell that story and they're like, damn, you gave up a lot. I'm like, did I? Did I? Because I don't know if I ever sell that business for 115 million without that partnership. I didn't have the information that got us over the finish line. I wasn't prepared to do that in 2019 when he looked at me, a young entrepreneur, and believed in me and wrote a multi-million dollar check into my business and then took the time to educate me and mentor me and teach me these things and guide me and answer every, I would call that guy, I'm not, if you're in my Rolodex and I'm learning from you, I am not bashful, like I will call you. And I called that man so many times, like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I'm thinking this, I wanna go left, I, you know, just, and he was part of my think tank for that two years. And so, you know, God bless him. That, and, that and he should you, make that money. And you can't like for anybody that's never been through the process, most of sales processes fail. Uh, people don't understand. I tell them, I run a coaching group where I coach entrepreneurs. I get 80 people that own mid, mid, you know, mid market size businesses. I tell them that all the time. They think that they could just bring the market to sell it at any given time and make, you know, all this money. I'm like, 90 something percent of businesses that ever go to market fail because you're not ready, you're not prepared, you don't understand what you're dealing with, and you're dealing with the most sophisticated business people on planet Earth. Like, I don't care what anyone says, those guys in those private equity companies were significantly smarter than I was. And thank God I had the, the help and the team with me to navigate that process. I mean, that process, I decided to sell the business in March of 2021, and we closed in December. It was a 10 month process. Yep. And it was it was every waking minute of the day for ten months. And the the quality of earnings audits, the going under the QB, covers, yep, the, the due diligence. You're having somebody who's been through that who can organize the business before it happens. We did, yeah. We with the guidance and and the team that we put together, which was my partner Joe, myself, and then the other thing that people don't understand is incredibly important is your advisory group, and yep. so. Uh, we had the right investment banker. We had the right M&A legal team. We had the right tax people and we had the right group. We were able to create such a competitive process for that business that we had, we went out to a buyer list of a hundred something people. We received like 40 uh, indication IOIs, they call them, indication of interest. Like, hey, we've, we've looked at your deck, we're interested. Here's a range of valuation that we believe you, your company falls under. And then we narrowed that down and, and took uh, LOIs from like the top 15. And then we, we took management meetings from nine out of the 15 groups. We dismissed six. I just want everybody to listen to this because here's the thing. I, I, I tell this to people. I don't know that they believe me, but I'm going to repeat it. I say the difference between the bullshitters 
the, oh, I've got an internet company that can make you millions and scale and grow you. And there's more of that yep. bullshit. Like I can spot these guys a mile away. 100%. I tell people three questions you want to ask anybody you're going to get advice for. Question number one, what's the most amount of money you've ever made in a year? Question number two, what's the biggest thing you personally have ever built quantified by revenues, number of employees, and profitability? And question three, what's the biggest exit you've ever had in your life? Because I've seen people build $100 million businesses to only get 10 or 15 million, and I've seen people build $30 million businesses like me who got 150 million. <laughs> so I wanna learn from the yeah. ones that actually engineered it yep. the best, right? So I tell people, the truth is when somebody has done something, they never forget it. Like you're talking about something that oh, happened in the past. Sure. True or false, when you go through the grind and you're in those moments wondering, is this going to close? Is it not going to close? Oh, we should have crossed that T. Oh, that di I didn't get dotted. Oh, that person that I didn't get a release from is going to sneak back and try to get a piece of the deal now and leverage me. Like, like when you go through it, you never forget a detail. A hundred percent. From every That's year your revenue, like you like said, this, yeah. like you said, my, I remember my, first employee I hired and now you're talking about the transaction yep. and the micro details you can tell because when somebody when you go what's the, when you ask those questions someone's like oh I can't really talk about it that's well, because it's bullshit yeah because yeah. anybody that's done it's going to be proud to talk about 100 percent and and I tell people that's how you flesh out the more detail somebody can give you it means they actually did it and this yeah. is true when you're trying to hire leadership and they're like oh I built a company from 10 million to 100 million, I know all about it. And you're like, great, talk to me about the year you did 10. What did you do next? And what'd you do next? And if they can't tell you, they didn't do it. That's right. They weren't that close to it. 100%. So I love this conversation because, man, it's like looking through a microscope, right? And and you and I have been through that colonoscopy yep. <laughs> without getting put under. Yeah. Because you're wide awake while it's going on because you're paying attention to what's happening around And you can die you. at any time. It's like, remember that game where they uh, – pick the bones out of the body as, you, as a kid. And if you hit the walls, the buzzer goes off. Yeah. That's what every day feels like. Like every day just feels like this thing could blow up at any moment, at any moment, you know, it, to finish what I was saying, we, we, we successfully managed to bring that down to two groups and we didn't award exclusivity to yep. both of those groups until they both had finished due diligence That's in right. the business. And so that was just an unbelievably masterful technique that I was, I can't take full credit for, I was a part of it. Um, and so we had to reimburse the runner up, the person we left at the altar, uh, a portion of their fees if, and if we didn't go with them. And we, but we got through the process. That's money well spent, by the way. Money well spent because the entire time they're looking for leverage. And so we kept leverage. Uh, we kept them in a competitive process until oh, seven days before we closed. I try to tell business owners, like, I, I, like they're like, oh, no, I got my guy. I'm like, you're already I screwed. Got, you're already screwed. You're so screwed. I got a guy in my coaching program. I, I could strangle him because he's already tried to sell the business one time and had a failed process. And it was too strategic. It's in the food and food and beverage industry. And they, they came back in the process. I'm like, you know what? You know, this isn't for us. And they left it alone. Stuck them with a million dollar bag of fees, Q V, legal, et cetera, right? And um, and he, he came back whooped. And that was about a year ago. And now recently he's like, no, this other strategic, they want to buy me. No, you don't understand. They're serious about it. And I'm like, buddy, do you know what an off-market deal is? Do you understand what? Yeah, 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 yeah. Why do people like off-market deals? Well, because it's not competitive and you can get it for a good price. So what do you think you are right now? You know what I mean? And I just, I cringe at anyone that's going to sell a business in most situations that isn't going to take it out for a competitive process. This is, well, what it is, how are you going to get maximum value? It's, it's, how it's, do you know what it's worth? You, you and I both know process? those guys are getting bullshitted and they're, and, and they don't want to pay and, fees. They're being cheap. Yeah. They, and and they they got it all figured out. This is the problem with with entrepreneurs. I've had a little bit of success. They think they've got it all figured yep. out. They don't have the first clue. And that's why ninety some odd percent of those deals fail, or they get so crammed down on at the end, People, and they're looking at that initial check. They give their business away. Yeah, because they've spent the money before they get it. That's right. And they get starstruck. They see stars, and and you know, becoming uh, becoming a chief executive officer, a builder of businesses, uh, a strategy guy that can build something that commands that much value, was one skill set. 
almost, I would say equally, uh, equally as difficult and equally as different was a skill set of becoming a guy that could package that business and successfully sell it. And the problem is, is that that most CEOs or business owners, entrepreneurs, founders that I've dealt with, they don't understand that they're not well equipped for this process just because they've successfully built a business. This is an entirely different animal. It really is. And so I was grateful for that first process to have the advisory group and the partnership group that I had with me. And that's really what we, I mean, we, we crushed on that exit. Like we it's did so good for the market and for what that business was like, we really did well. And we had two horses at the end. We picked one. Uh, and then, you know, like everything else, nothing goes right. The, the group that we didn't transact with ended up coming in and recruiting like half of the yep, leadership that, team. This is, like, so, so this is so got so this litigation is, threats and all this crazy so stuff. So this is the thing I try to tell yep. business owners half the time when they're like, oh, I got a strategic and they want to buy me. And they just I'm just working. They just want to sniff under your hood and 100%. find out who they should steal and poach from you and find out any ideas they don't have. And, and you're yep. stupid enough to give them the data room because you don't know what you're doing. Yep. And, and you don't have the right non-disclosures, non-competes, non-solicitations. You don't have all those For elements sure. because you're working with some hack lawyer in your hometown. Look, dude, you and I both know, and we've seen it all. And so for this show, Building Billions with Brandon, it isn't just about building a billion-dollar business. And, I, and in my book, Nine Figure Mindset, this book right here, it's coming to market in September. You should be pre-ordering that right now. We'll put a link in on where you can order that from. It talks about how to get your mind right. Here's what, here's what, when I was building my first business, I, was, I mean, everyone said I couldn't do it. High school graduate. They said, you know, least likely to succeed. And there I am. I get my first million I raise. And then I go out and get my, buy my first million dollar business. And the next, you know, I'm 130 million in businesses I acquired and, and I, I've raised $38 million and I listed on the uh, American Stock Exchange at 29 years old. If you try to tell me anything at 29 years old, I would have said, dude, I came from nothing. I've got a public company on Wall Street. I've acquired all these businesses. I've raised all this capital. I'm innovating this space. What do you know? That's what you, that's what I'm 29. At 31, Warburg said, hey, thanks for all your hard work. These documents that you didn't know what you signed, we just liquidated your company and fuck off. Yeah. And by the way, you get nothing because we had an internal rate of return of 18 to 22% before you get anything. I woke up one day, I was at the peak of my career, May of 2001, and I was at the lowest point of my life in June 1st of 2001. Like literally a two week window where I was at the absolute peak, like everything in my life seemed like it was gonna go through the moon and then two weeks later, I was relieved of command with my company being sold without me being able to do anything about it. Wild. Things can change fast in this game. And that's why when you use that analogy of the buzzer, like every day you're living like that. Yeah. All the way until you find, that's why that <laughs> exit, consummating the exit and, and that wire. I, oh, talk I know about that, dude, how, so for me, talk I was, in, that. for me, I was in Spain <laughs> and my bank got the, the wire got down to two minutes before it was cut off. And it still hadn't got the email confirmation yet. Tell me about the window of time where you waited that last 10 hours for that wire to hit the account. Dude, we had, you know, I don't know why in my head closing was going to be much more dramatic than it was. It was, a f I was with nobody. I was with my, my now chief operating officer that's still with me, uh, Lori Bedreau. And we were in my conference room and we got on a call and the lawyers were on and the buyer was on and, and you know, they just read over some stuff and they said, all right, you know, we're ready to close. And everyone kind of sounded off and said, yep, clear to close. I said, Eric, you, you clear to close. I said, clear to close. And it was like a six minute phone call. And I, we got off the call and I remember the, just the deep, I probably the deepest breath I've ever taken in my life. And I was like, Oh, and then you know, I got Merrill Lynch for banking and uh, one of them. And so I got the online, you know, app or whatever it is, Merrill Lynch app. And all day I'm sitting there looking at refresh, 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 refresh. This is what I was refreshing, refresh. So it was five and then five o'clock hit. And I was like, no wire. 
and um, it was like 6.30 at night, and I kind of given up. I'm like, all right, maybe it's coming the next day, you know? And I just picked up my phone and went, ding. And it went from a good-sized number to a, holy shit, <laughs> I've never seen that much money in my life, you know? And that thing hit, and I was just like, wow, wow. But, you know, one thing that's not talked about often is what happens after the sale. And I think, I know, I would assume that you have had similar experiences. Like, I made it a couple months. People funny. People are funny. They think that, like, getting a boat and, and being on the beach and going out to restaurants and, like, not having anything to do and not having anywhere to be is uh, being kind of retired is, like, the jam. You know what I mean? I was 36 years old with tens and tens and tens and tens of millions of dollars in the bank. And a house in Miami, I had already bought my jet. I'd already bought a big ass 95 foot yacht. I had, you know, a giant house up north, my, my beautiful home here. And I didn't have a care in the world. And I made it like a couple months. I was going out at night and, you know, yep. doing all this stuff, blowing money and, and li like living for the, you know. And I, was just, I woke up one day and I was like, this sucks. I was like, this is terrible. And I learned a lot about myself in those months. I was like, I am not a guy that can just do this. I need a mission. I need to be doing and building and growing and, and doing something. And so, um, you know, I did Brad Lee's podcast a while back and he was uh, making fun of me a little bit. So it's like, you know, Brad, I'm, I'm certainly got more money than I've ever had in my entire life, but I'm working as hard, if not harder, than I've ever worked in my entire life. And he's like, you're doing it wrong, brother. I'm like, yeah, that but, might but, be you your know, perspective. That, I feel look, like I'm doing it right because I, lo love, I, lo it. I, I lo love this shit. I love Brad, but let me tell you something. That's just, that that's coming from somebody who has not actually experienced what you and I experienced. Yeah, good point. Because I sold my business, but part of the deal was I did a 36-month th integration and took the billion-dollar company to $4.5 billion. Then I had two years left, and they're like, you way overachieved Go just home. do special projects for us so then i was like okay so i made it about a year and i was running around with all my billionaire friends playing golf going to europe eating every night gained 35 pounds yep and one day i natalie and i were flying back i get emotional talking about it yep. and i had that meltdown i was like this sucks i was at a lower point than when warburg sold out from underneath me yep I did our brother with I feel all you. that money in the bank. I feel you. And, and the stresses of, you want to see almost every relationship that you've ever had change. Yep. Sell your business. A hundred percent. The fucking loneliness of that. And yep. then you're miserable and you get all this fancy shit and it looks great from the outside. Who the fuck wants to hear you complain? Who yep. wants to listen to that? Like, who do you talk to? You're like, what am I going to call some one of my buddies up and be like, you know, this this hundred million is really terrible, you know. And so it was really lonely. It was really depressing. I was miserable. Um, and and I just made the decision. I was like, I, I am a guy that has to wake up and have a mission and go build every single day. And at this point, I'm convinced I'll probably do that until the day they bury me because you and I are so alike. I, I mean, we, we I made that decision it. in yeah. uh, the. I had that meltdown. I'm talking it was a meltdown. Yeah, no doubt. Like, I bawled like a little baby. And my wife, a uh, girlfriend at the time, it, she's cause, like. Because in that moment, and I did too, in that moment for me, I realized that all of this is very cool and I'm very grateful, but it's not what I thought it would be. Yep. And it's not what most people think it would ever be. It's much different. It doesn't do what most people think it's going to do. And that moment of truth and epiphany for me was painful. And, and it, yeah. So I didn't mean to well, and, and part of it is, too, as I've gone backwards, that analogy of the, the doctor game and the buzzer going off, it's the boiling frog theory. You don't really, even if you're not, the stress of building doesn't seem that hard. All of a sudden, when you realize, I did, like, I did it, and now I'm the... I'm, I'm, I'm like pissing my life away. Like I don't deserve it now mm -hmm. because I'm not contributing anymore. Yeah. And, and so that happened at the end of 18 and that inspired us to figure out what to do next. And, and that's how we found Grant and yep. Elena. I took all my business stuff and said, I'm, I'm going to go. I had done 10 years of research to do something bigger. The other thing was, is like, I actually got to a place is like, do I really want to go do it again? And then that's when I took the year off. And then I felt so 
because it was my life's dream to go change small business. And so we activated, part, went and saw Grant and Elena at GrowthCon, did all this uh, research on different influencers and what they did and who we might align with. And they didn't know who we were and, and went to that and then approached them. And then here we are later. Literally, it was 48 months ago we generated our first revenue, June of 19. And we did $200,000 in June of 19. It was me, Natalie, and one other gal that works for us. June of this year, we did uh, uh, 13 and a half million. <laughs> That's so cool. So in four years, I've built something with Grant and Elena and Natalie five times bigger than what I spent 14 years building. My EBITDA this year will be 20% larger than my revenue was the year I sold. Amazing. Imagine, Imagine that. how when you actually can channel and get in the flow the the experience of of ha you like as you were talking about earlier about people that know the details and and have been on the battlefield and and gone all that you know I'm experiencing the same thing now in the company that I'm building, you know we launched uh, we started it a year ago maybe 13 14 months ago, and generated our first dollar of revenue which for us means a patient admitted and treated on New Year's Day. And we've, you know, we're in our seventh month of operation and we're in the black. We're producing even so we, we have our second and third locations in development. And so the second time is so much faster than the first, you know, it, it, one of the I heard a quote uh, and I'll, I'll mess it up, uh, but it, it was really impactful to me. At, and it came to me at the right time. because when I was, it was when I was going through that transition and it said, you know, it's really dangerous for a man to climb a mountain and get to the top and not have another mountain to climb. Mm. That's a that's a good quote there. And I was like, damn, I need a mountain to climb. And so, you know, the things that have become important to me today are relationships and people, time, and and winning every day. That And, and I think about winning every day as not, you know, mo money and success and all these things count in that. But, like, did I live a day today that I could be proud of, you know? I was, when I was like playing tennis and going out and staying out till three in the morning and spending money on stupid shit and, and having a lot of fun, I had a lot of fun, but I wasn't really proud of it. You know what I mean? I wasn't yep. proud of what I was doing every day. And, um, and so now like, you know, I'm, I'm grinding, I'm working and, and you are too, and building something to be proud of. Like you, what you just said about the revenue growth in your business. Like that's something like, damn, that feels yep. good. That yep. feels good better than having the money itself. You know, uh, I think that's where. I think that's the interesting thing that we'll end the show with is is it's the conquering. Yeah. 100%. It's the journey. It is not it's it hunt. is not it's the hunt and and it's the journey. It's not when you arrive at the destination because what you just said about that mountain. Yeah. It's it's I I roast guys on um in my comments on Instagram all the time. I'll speak up and they they always say some stu and it speaks to to the psychology of people at whatever level you would describe them at and they say things like oh with all that money you're not happy and i said brother you're the materialistic one you're the one that thinks money will make you happy i love the process i love the game i love the hunt the kill you know i'm here because i'm having a blast and so and on. and i know i know for because i can just already tell how how much you and i vibe the other thing is too you look at all the people you surround yourself with and you want to go create that for them yeah. you, you want them to get to experience a hundred percent yeah. And that, that's, for me, a big motivation. How many thousands of people can I drive in their success equation yeah. to be able to reach the level that I reached? And I'm just smart enough to know that if I get thousands of them, I'm going to be a billionaire this yeah, time you'll be, doing, you'll be doing okay yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, Eric, uh, yeah. what a great interview. You know, thank you, thank you for you spending, having me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I know you and I are going to do some things together. Yes, uh, we don't know exactly what that is yet, but we are definitely going to do some things together. Hey, yes, if sir. you liked... This interview, if you found it informative, uh, educational, interesting, leave a review, you know, share it, uh, like it. This is what inspires me to continue to do these shows. And it's what inspires a guy like Eric to show up and That's come it. spend time with me. And maybe you learned a lot if you were listening into this thing, you know, in the process from two guys that have been there and done it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that ha that our pocketbooks will show that we're not bullshitters. It's not what we say, it's what we did. And so if you want to know how to get your mind right to get your money right and achieve a nine-figure 
exit than you first got to achieve a, a nine figure mindset because it really is going to be about what's going on uh, going on up there thank you for joining me eric thank you thank for joining you so me for thank you for joining me on another episode of building billions with brandon dawson